Welcome. Bienvenidos a Elecciones 2018. I'm Elizabeth Ortega Lomayer, your host and producer. Tonight you have a chance to hear and meet Chris Wilhelm. Is that correct? Yeah. Chris Wilhelm. Uh, he's a candidate for County Council at Large. He's one of 38 candidates. And Mr. Wilhelm is an ESOL teacher at Norwood High School. He worked at Impact Silver Spring, where he coordinated outreach for immigrant youth and their families. And with us is Santiago David Tavara. Uh, he's a writer, editor, and reporter. Chris, let's start with you. Uh, tell us about your experience in Silver Spring, Impact Silver Spring. Sure. So, um, like you said, right now I'm an ESOL teacher at Northwood High School. Uh, before I became an educator, I worked at Impact Silver Spring, and it's an organization that's been around since uh, the late 90s that was born out of the redevelopment of Silver Spring. And uh, the organization was founded by uh, a group of activists and a woman named Frankie Blackburn because there was a feeling that when all of the change happened in downtown Silver Spring and we got all of these new amenities and development that not all the voices in that community were included in that process and so there was a frustration with that and so they wanted to make sure that uh, you know the diverse community that we celebrate in Montgomery County and in Silver Spring in particular is not just there but is connected to you know the governing processes of the county that you know the community is really integrated and connected so when i worked at impact we uh it was during the economic recession and we were working specifically on making sure that uh, immigrant families in the silver spring area particularly in the schools that feed into blair high school and springbrook were connected to county services so we were doing a lot of door knocking we were had a big bilingual staff of people who were doing outreach um, and making sure that all the great services that we have in Montgomery County were actually available to people and people knew about them and were uh, accessing them. I heard that you did above and beyond with the kids. Uh, <laughs> we had a great time. Part of my job um, was participating in the outreach, but we also had a youth sports program where we basically used youth sports as a way to provide great activities for um, the kids who were kind of usually disconnected from the local sports leagues that I grew up playing in. Like I played uh, in MSI uh, soccer growing up in Montgomery County, all over Montgomery County. Um, and there's a lot of families that are just not usually connected to those leagues. So we made sure kids were connected to the leagues. We connected with their parents through the soccer teams. Um, and then we also did a lot of fun things. Like I helped raise money to bring kids to a game to see El Salvador play against Argentina, things like that. Mm -hmm. Little things that maybe the kids didn't have an opportunity to do in their regular schedules. And so they will never forget that. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Why are you running? Why do you, do you decide to run? This is, uh, this is your first time, right? You are, you are young, you are 31, you are one of the youngest uh, in the competition, in these uh, elections. Right. And how do you feel about it? Um, I feel good about that. I think there you're seeing uh, a generation of people even younger than me, a current high school students who are some of the leading voices on important issues right now, um, and also people in my generation who are, you know, maybe a decade older than the current high school students getting involved uh, for the first time as candidates. Most of us, there's a whole cohort of people who are running for different offices, um, have been very involved in the community in different ways, but haven't been on the ballot before. So I think it's an exciting time to be involved in, in county in this county election. Um, I'm running for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of specific issues I want to work on, but there's one general feeling and frustration that I've had with Montgomery County for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up here and have lived here all my life and have been involved in education issues and, and a lot of different things, but one feeling I have about Montgomery County is that sometimes we pat ourselves on the back a little bit too much. And we think that because all of our elected officials are Democrats, that everything must be going fine and we're doing everything in the most progressive way possible. And I just don't think that's always the case. And I think that I, I decided to run this cycle um, to work on specific issues, but also to make sure that there would be somebody running 
for office this cycle and hopefully on the council that was kind of willing to be a little more critical of the current state of things for uh, for people and on some specific issues that I want to work and on. And why are you running with Brandy Brooks? Sure. So Brandy Brooks is another one of the 33 Democrats who's running for uh, county council at large. Um, I The ballot is alphabetical by last name. So I am dead last on the ballot, uh, which isn't so bad because I can tell people where to find me. Brandy Brooks is up closer to the top. And we met... Um, maybe a year and a half ago before either of us had actually decided to definitely do this and we just met to talk about issues that we were interested in she was working for progressive maryland uh, which at the time was in the middle of the uh, the fight for the 15 dollars minimum wage i was teaching and trying to decide whether to to run for office and we just connected on uh, kind of our motivations for being involved in the community issues that we wanted to work on if we were going to run for office and then a couple months later we realized both of us had made this decision to jump in and do it uh, and we have been fortunate enough to share a lot of the progressive endorsements in this process from the teachers union and several of the other environmental and, and labor unions um, so you know we decided if we really are going to make process progress on the issues that we're uh, fighting for that we need more than one vote and we wanted to to fight together in the campaign and hopefully serve together on the council Good. You're trying you're knocking on doors and you're trying to outreach people who don't feel part of the system who feel disengaged who don't trust political parties, you mm -hmm. know, we see this uh, the governor is a Republican right. What's wrong with 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 this state and what are you telling them this to this voters, you know? Some of them don't want to get involved, they just get involved in the presidential elections right. every four years. What are you telling them? Well, I mean, it's been really fascinating. That, that's exactly right. We've been door knocking in communities all over the county. Um, I think that the usual strategy for running a campaign to the entire county is just to send as many big mail pieces as you can close to the election, remind people about your name. Uh, but we wanted to do things a little bit differently. And so we've been out in neighborhoods and we specifically have been targeting people who vote frequently, but also those folks who you mentioned who maybe only vote in presidential campaigns. And what we're finding is that, you know, kind of the idea out there is that these folks are, um, you know, they don't want to be involved or they don't care about local issues. And the reality is that for most of them, nobody has ever come to ask them exactly. to participate. Uh, nobody has ever come to knock on their door and say, hi, I'm running for county council. This is what the county council does. This is how, you know, the decisions that those nine people make affect you and your neighborhood. And the result of that is that people don't know how the structure of the county impacts them. So we've been trying to change that through our campaign. And I think it's... If we want Montgomery County to be more representative of the people who live here, uh, we have to do more outreach in those communities. And it also filters up to state level politics. It's the reason why we have a Republican governor, because in 2014, we did not, the Democratic Party did not reach out to those people. And, uh, you know, I think we need to build a more consistent um, frame for connecting with people so that we're not just showing up right before an election and saying, oh, please come vote. No, it has to be an ongoing conversation about the issues that matter to people. And also because the populations have changed. A lot. You go to Germantown, that's the United Nations there. Yep. It's like people from all over the world. That's right. And um, they are forgotten, I guess. Um, I don't see the, 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 the people in the county working in that direction with them. Tell, uh, tell us, what is, how do you define economic inequality? Mm. Well, obviously, economic inequality is has been growing around the country, and it's particularly acute in places like Montgomery County because we have uh, such segregated housing that we have some zip codes in Montgomery County that are the wealthiest in the nation um, down in the Chevy Chase, Bethesda, Potomac areas, um, and other zip codes where you know, people, a lot of the kids that I teach at Northwood High School live in the lowest income zip codes in the county. And so that inequality is acute in, in a lot of areas of Montgomery County. And that filters into every 
aspect of the way people live here. I mean, you know, this is another thing we've been talking about a lot. There's a very high quality of life for a lot of people in Montgomery County. And I think we have that reputation as having good schools and parks and resources. But there's a whole swath of people in Montgomery County, some of them who are new residents, but a lot of people who have been here for a long time that have not benefited from uh, the economic success that other people enjoy. So I think that's another lens through which to see county issues. And I'm excited that the council, the current council has decided to uh, pass a resolution to basically say, we have to look at county issues through a racial equity lens and to see every decision that the county makes, it impacts people differently and how, you know, is this decision equitable for everybody in the county, not just the people who usually show up at council meetings, you know, all the folks who we're talking about who may be a little more disconnected from county politics, how do our, how are our division, decisions affecting them? Do you have some proposals on this, some specific proposals? Or? Yeah, there's a lot of things. I mean, I, the first thing that I look at when I am uh, kind of measuring how a community uh, is in terms of their progressive values is how are the lowest paid employees in the county treated and how is their standard of living in Montgomery County we have our sanitation workers who are the the door-to-door -door trash collectors who collect everybody's trash every week um, they're no longer county employees they work for a private contractor and the lowest paid workers out of that population only make $22,000 a year with no benefits. Um, so you can imagine $22,000 a year is 20% of the median income in the county. It's next to impossible to live a decent standard of living in Montgomery County on that salary. And it's also sanitation work is what is the fifth most dangerous job in the country. It's more dangerous than being a police officer. So that's the kind of issue where I want us to take a look at, you know, how are the lowest paid workers being treated? It's the same thing in the school system. A lot of uh, folks in the school system who aren't teachers or principals, the folks who are doing the, you know, food preparation and uh, janitorial work, they have decent benefits, but their salaries are really not enough to to survive in Montgomery County without working additional hours, which it really affects people's you know time with their families and their quality of life. Mm -hmm. What's your reaction on Amazon plans to bring their headquarters here to Montgomery? Uh, will you approve some incentives? Um, yeah, I, honestly, I'm very skeptical of uh, of the plan that's been put forward, and I know that the majority of people who are currently in office in Montgomery County and around the state have been openly supportive of the Amazon proposal, but I would like us to take a step back and really think about um, who is going to benefit from, from that proposal. And I know that a lot of what has been put forward is uh, incentives for basically transportation funding and tax incentives, uh, $8.5 billion worth in total, which is many times over the biggest incentive package that's ever been offered in Montgomery in Maryland. Uh, my concern is how are the people who live here right now going to benefit from that? And right now there is no money in the incentive deal for education. So we're, our school system is growing at 2,500 students per year. We have schools that are falling apart like Lee Middle School and all these other schools in the county that desperately need renovation and our current budgets can't support our current capacity needs. So I know there's a lot of talk about the tax revenue that Amazon would bring, but that's not gonna be the case if we're giving all of the tax revenue back in the incentive deal. Uh, and it's not going to be the case if there's no direct money for education. I'm also looking at, you know, how does it benefit my students at Northwood High School who are in the lower economic spectrum? And, uh, you know, right now they don't have a path to getting a four-year computer science or marketing or business degree to get one of those high-paying jobs at Amazon. Um, so, you know, I want to see, like Toronto, they're one of the finalists to get the Amazon headquarters as well. Part of their incentive package was to uh, say, we're going to invest in education and make sure that there's a pathway for everybody who lives in that community to be able to access those jobs. So I just don't see that in the current deal. Um, and I worry about our ability to handle that amount of development and, and who will benefit from that. ¿Y hablas español, Chris? Estoy tratando de aprender, sí. <laughs> Mis alumnos 
me enseñó mucho, pero no, no sé, yo sabía o estaba pensando si, si puedo hacer esta entrevista en español, pero creo que, creo que no. <risa> What about endorsement? Have you received an endorsement, big endorsement, from people or corporations or the Washington Post? I, don't know. Um, I did not get the Washington Post, uh, but we... Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I didn't know how they usually go. Usually they don't tend to endorse the people who are endorsed by the teachers union. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was endorsed by the teachers union this year who, you know, that's a group of, of people who have been fighting for progressive issues and and issues that really matter to parents and children um, and has that iconic Apple ballot logo that a lot of people know. So that's probably our, our highest profile endorsement. But I've also been working really hard to earn the support of environmental organizations. So there's the Climate Mobilization and the Green Democrats are two organizations that have been pushing the county to not just talk about how we're going to deal with climate change, but to basically have an honest conversation that if we're going to make a difference on climate change, it's going to require sacrifices. And we can't just pass resolutions that say we have a climate emergency. We have to be honest about what it's going to take and what sacrifices we're going to have to make as an entire community, as an entire country um, to address this. And I know because I'm with young people all the time, um, they are angry about the world that they're inheriting. And, yeah. you know, we really need to have an open conversation about these kind of things. And who is financing your campaign? So I'm really excited to be using the new public campaign financing system that we have in Montgomery County. Um, it's one of the things that Brandy and I talked about uh, when we were deciding whether to run or not. And uh, this system, basically, I'm sure some of the other folks you've interviewed have talked about it, but if you decide to use the new financing system, uh, it's optional, and I've opted into it. You can't take any money from corporations at all. You can't take money from any political action committees or unions. You can only take money from individuals, uh, and the most that you can accept is $150. If you're using the old system, you can take $6,000 from a developer or a corporation, you can take $6,000 from the people who work for that company. You could basically fund your entire campaign from one little network of people. Um, and if you're using the new public financing system, which I am, it basically forces you to grow, go out and run a grassroots campaign and to knock doors to engage people and to have lots of little house party conversations. We've had almost 50 house parties. We've knocked on tens of thousands of doors. And our campaign has been funded by 750 Montgomery County residents who've contributed an average of $50 that gets matched by the public election system. So we've been able to raise a very competitive amount of money, enough to run uh, a very competitive campaign without having to go to those folks who have kind of typically funded campaigns in Montgomery County. So are you mixing the monies, well, um, uh, Brandy and you, or no, separate? No, it has to be very separate. And mm -hmm. because of the new public financing system, there are a lot of rules about things that we can do together and things that we can't. Oh, okay. So we got we had to get very explicit permission, permission from mm -hmm. the State Board of Elections to do a joint mail piece. And so that arrived at people's doors last mm -hmm. week. Uh, we can't have a slate or any in-kind contributions between the campaigns or anything like that, but we can basically produce joint literature and joint I'm materials. Okay. And basically, you can do almost anything as long as it has both of the campaign's authority lines on it, and it mm -hmm. says, we have approved this material uh, and things like that. We also cannot coordinate any of our door knocking or, or any of that kind of thing, so that has to be separate. Do you agree with those rules or no? You disagree? Or, uh... Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that having those rules in place is important. And I think it would be reasonable to allow publicly financed candidates to coordinate more because we have an advantage that we're getting matching funds, but we have the disadvantage that we can't receive these huge chunks of money that other people are taking from, from corporations and outside groups. Um, and also in-kind contributions. So, you know, folks could go out and for another campaign, they could be putting up giant posters or, you know, doing a mailer or things like that. And those are things that we can't do because we're participating in public financing. Many people told us to interview you, 
the many people like you. I see in here in Facebook that a lot of people are sending uh, likes for you. <laughs> <laughs> are you ready for the elections? Are you exhausted? Are you can you you know wait more? Any no, I'm waiting? excited. I'm excited because we have built a really amazing team of people who've been working for more than a year now. Uh, we knew that the public financing system, um, because I was a first time candidate, would take a lot of time to raise the number of contributions to be successful. So we've been campaigning since May of 2017 and knocking as many doors as we can. Uh, it's been a really exciting process. And, uh, you know, I think we have a good shot at, at being one of the people who can make it, especially because I think the last month is going to be really important. People are, you know, grabbing or receiving one of these mm -hmm. mailers, five of them a day at this point. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they help, but talking people to people face to face, I think is even more important. Can you give us your website address? Sure. It's www.wilhelmforcouncil.com spelled out F-O-R, wilhelmforcouncil.com. Thank you very much for being with us, Chris. Thank you for having me. I, I really wish you the best in your, in the elections. Thanks. Thank you, Santiago. Thank you. And Thank we'll you. be back in one hour.